or perhaps in a rush of unabashed admiration, one could wonder how a frail little boy born as Saraswati Chandra in the village of Dhank near Porbandar in 1927 could pack so many lifetimes into one life. Or today, a considerable distance away from the high tide of his scholarly output, one may also choose to critically assess his legacy. Perhaps my claim to talking on this platform today is that I may be able to bring in a little of all these ways of seeing his scholarship while also quietly recalling in the mind's eye his love for gems and embroidery, music and dance, ghosts and science fiction, flowers, and Gita Ben, his wife, Gitanjali Dhaki. To me, he was Dhaki sir, my mentor and doctoral research supervisor, and his role in shaping my journey as an art historian has been pivotal. So I cannot thank Sambhasha and Mrs. Chetna Gosavi and her team enough for this pleasant opportunity to deliver the first Emidhaki Memorial Lecture. Today, I choose to focus on only very few of his contributions, that too, limited to temple studies, a subject with which he has been most passionately involved and to which he has dedicated the maximum amount of his time, energy, and intellect. It is through this then that I hope to open many more windows into the vast vistas of his research his motivations, methods, provocations, and contributions. Dhaki's tryst with temples began early. His role in the Archaeological Research Society of Porbandar since 1953, presaging his lifelong commitment to the subject. This was well before the Encyclopedia of Indian Temple Architecture Project was conceived and formulated in 1966 and located at the then American Academy of Banaras, now the American Institute of Indian Studies. In cooperation with a few like-minded scholars, notably the late Professor Pramod Chandra, the late Sri Krishna Devaji, and Professor Michael Meister. How Dhaki experienced the countless temples that he visited, documented, and wrote about during the fruitful and tireless decades that followed is perhaps best expressed in his own words. So he says in his Prasada as Cosmos, it was an awesome, staggering, incredible cognition, which some later tried to convey in texts through metaphors. The particular aspect that each author sensed depended upon his standpoint. Those who viewed the temple at close quarters saw in its organization and stratified divisions, its details, voids and masses, the embodiment of prakriti or nature, cosmos, creation, manifest or empirical reality with its interminable though coherent amalgam of the tangible and intangible, the seen and unseen, the sensed and unsensed verities. So what I'm getting at is that certainly for Dhaki, the truth resided in the details of the temple's form and imagery. And it is through these details that he has addressed the temple's totality in its aesthetic, formal, and metaphysical, rather than in its sectarian or religio-ritualistic terms. His aesthetic scientific mind 
has subjected the temples, their boldest expressions and their most elusive details. To the rigors of his research, examining the paths and their relationships to the configured whole in culture specific contexts. Already by the early 1960s, the results of his intense engagements and inquiries on the temples of Gujarat and Rajasthan had started to appear in print. Tireless fieldwork and documentation, perceptive structural stylistic analysis, and incisive textual terminological inquiries rooted in the historical milieu are in evidence already in his monograph on the chronology of the Solanki temples of Gujarat in 1961, and his co-authored ceilings in the temples of Gujarat in 1963. In the Solanki temples, in the chronology of the Solanki temples of Gujarat, Dhaki reveals an early awareness of the problems of using dynastic appellations for design designating art styles. He compares stylistically distinct temples belonging to the same political domain, clarifying that since kings, I'm quoting him, do not create a style in India, but being important patrons give powerful impetus to the continuation and development of the style, the true makers of the style being the architects and sculptors themselves, the denomination Solanki is a convenient label only. Now, why I'm stressing this is that uh, the encyclopedia has come in for a lot of criticism at one point for using dynastic relations. Now, uh, and it is uh, a, a, a Ghosh actually in 1962 who raised this issue of dynastic appellations and regional specificities in a, in a bigger way. But already in 1961, he shows a very clear awareness of, uh, you know, the region versus dynasty issue. Now, eight years later, in 1969, his incisive analysis of the Maitrak and Sandha temples of Gujarat unveils critical missing links that these Surashtra temples filled in the history of Indian temple architecture. By then, Dhaki was convinced of the importance of employing appropriate technical terminology in temple studies and had already worked through a vast corpus of architectural terms from the Vastu Shastras. This approach is noticeable in his Kiradu and the Maru Gurjar architecture published as early as 1967. By the time Dhaki was 40, he had done a, a corpus of work that um, scholars may not manage in a lifetime. From the interaction of the, the forms of a temple's moldings with its applied decoration, says Dhaki, there emerges an unmistakable architectural pattern distinctive of the style as expressed in a particular place, a particular time, a particular temple. The formulation in precise terms of the character of this pattern is possible only in the language of the Vastu Shastras. So he, he, there, there is the, this is twofold emphasis uh, at this point, uh, just you know, almost concurrent to the, the initiation of the encyclopedia project, because a lot of uh, people associate him only with the encyclopedia project. But it's actually all of this that he brought into the encyclopedia project. And uh, before it, uh, it had begun, he had this work already laid out. His scientific temper gained from his deep study of the Indian philosophical systems and his training in the pure sciences during his graduation days at the University of Bombay. This is also evident in those writings where he clarifies the intricacies of the temple's formal logic, the relationship of the ground plan to elevations, and the relative configuration of the architectural moldings, elements, motifs in relation to the overall structure. His 
method of systematic documentation, terminology driven uh, analysis, and the distinction between structural, functional, and ornamental criteria is certainly a gift of the pure sciences to art historical studies. In the Indian temple forms in Karnat inscriptions and architecture in 1977, we encounter the simultaneous use of inscriptions, texts, and architecture to unravel the presence of varied temple models, Nagvarit, Dravida, Pumija, Vesara, as these were understood by the architects of medieval Karnataka. This easy familiarity with both Northern and Southern Vastu Shastras, Agamas and Samhitas, and with an enormous number of actually extant temples all over the country informed his work. Earlier in 1972, he had already authored an as yet unpublished manuscript, the principal forms of, it's still not published, the principal forms of Indian temple superstructure in a staggering collation of a range of textual sources and their interrelationships with uh, actual buildings. Now from his 300 plus publications, that inform his bibliography. One notices from the late 1960s to the early 1980s, an onrush of papers that bring together the normative treatise with literary prose and hymnic literature, the living tradition of practicing sthapatis and the evidence of extant structures. These reveal the pace that he had set for himself he was a man on a mission for liberating Indian architectural history from its colonial moorings into and in Eurocentric perspectives and to establish for the discipline of Indian architectural history an evidence-based analysis from within its cultural milieu. Now, I'm not suggesting that he's the only one who looked at texts or that he's the only one who correlated them with monuments. There, was, there were other scholars, Ram Raz, Ananda Kumaraswamy, PK Acharya, and others who had correlated monuments to texts. But never before had such an enterprise transpired on such a comprehensive scale, nor with the perception, precision, and authority that Dhaki bestowed to the subject. Nama, name or term in his method, is not applicated to rupa, form or structure. Rather, the distinctive logic of varied temple forms, elements and motifs enter into a meaningful dialogue with texts, each illuminating the other. Now, all of this exponentially increasing knowledge about the temple's structural logic and its corresponding terminological basis, which Dhaki was offering in his prolific writings, was simultaneously also nourishing the Encyclopedia Project, located in the American Academy of Banaras, now in the American Institute of Indian Studies in Gurgaon. And Dhaki's own understanding of temple forms and styles was being enriched by the intense documentation and teamwork across the length and breadth of the country as part of the encyclopedia project. I will show a few visuals in between. Until 1992, Michael Meister was the editor with M.A. Dhaki, who at first was coordinator and next also the editor besides being an author and moving force. From 1992, Dhaki had been the sole editor of the series for all but one of the parts. And the sole author of the most voluminous, this is missed by most people, Sabse Moti, <laughs> uh, medieval uh, uh, Upper Dravid Desh volume is completely authored by Dhaki. He's not the, he's not the uh, editor, just the editor. One of the use of Sanskrit architectural terminology in the encyclopedia volumes 
and the resistance and uh, criticism that followed about the use of Sanskrit architectural terminology with such intensity. Uh, uh, I would say, let us visit what we may all have our views on it. Uh, a lot of scholars find the encyclopedia volumes extremely Sanskritized and Sanskrit driven. So let us visit Dhaki's response, uh, which uh, in proportion to the kind of uh, intellect and work and labor that went into it, uh, seems to be an exemplar of his restraint and confident recourse. So all that he says in, in responses, that strong reservations on the, this is Taki, strong reservations on the usage of Sanskrit terms had been voiced in some quarters. However, we have parallels for the usage of the characteristic terminology of a given land in other fields. For instance, the employment of Arabic and Persian terms for Islamic architecture architecture, Greek and Latin for Hellenic and Roman architecture, French, German, and Spanish terms for Romanesque and Gothic architecture, Chinese terms in understanding the Chinese paintings and philosophy, and in India too, in the realms of Indian philosophy, literature, and Indology in general, several Sanskrit and Pali Prakrit terms are used. Why then? the opposition in the field of Indian temple architecture. That's, that was the one response in the next Aita volume that came out. Now to the 14 Aita volumes, which have addressed the structural and stylistic progressions of Indian temples. They have located them in their historical settings, unraveled their formal logic, and arrived at a reliable terminological corpus. Michael Meister, uh, Taki's closest collaborator, and uh, you know they had the longest working partnership, uh, explains that these volumes have addressed the issue of style as a nexus between region and patronage, since artistic traditions are taken to be rooted in a territory, given shape by dynastic patronage, and then spread by the course of empire. The glossary volume I will come to, um, which uh, he prefers to call as Sri Dravida Devale Vastu Paribhasha Pragnapti, uh, I will discuss uh, its importance and uh, how much the world of architectural history would benefit if we could all uh, have it in, in published form soon. Now, I've been talking structure, I've been talking terminology, I've been talking scientific organization. Uh, all this was a lot of grammar, a lot of rigor, uh, but Dhaki's oeuvre was not fettered by the weight of all this grammar and structure that he himself evolved uh, or reworked. He certainly did not miss the beauty of the forest or miss the woods for the trees. Although the rigors of classification, terminology, iconography, epigraphy, and archeology span were fundamental to him, he viewed these only as the basis and not the goal of art historical research. One encounters this refrain in many of his writings, its emphasis and phraseology changing every time. So let's just take his uh, a lit a one sentence from his uh, presidential address to the Indian Art History Congress, where he says, an exclusively archaeological approach is not a prime objective of the discipline of history of art. The classificatory, nomenclatural, and metrographical aspects of buildings and the iconographical, iconomical, even iconological considerations for sculptures lose centrality and become secondary in importance. They are auxiliary agents, but not the ultimate determinants of the domain of history of art. So what is it that Dhaki privileged in his art historical research? 
for Dhaki, this is now unquote, it was the aesthetic discernment in visual perception, the eye for detail, and most importantly, that critical art historical construct style or riti to which Dhaki remained most committed in architecture and in sculpture. The relationship between style, region, patronage finds its most detailed and incisive treatment for Western Indian temples in his groundbreaking work, the genesis and development of Maru Gurjar temple architecture. In 1975, where he analyzes the union of the sculpturesque Mahamaru style with the architectonic Mahagurjar style, leading to the creation of Maru Gurja style of architecture, a term coined by him. Temples, architecture, and mobility. His methodology in this monograph like paper has been influential in the works of many of us. So, Alka Patel looks at the Rahman Prasada in Afghanistan. Tamara Sears follows river routes to see how uh, architectural architecture has been constructed. Nachike Chanchini finds the uh, Maru Burjar style in, uh, in the Northern Himalayan tract. And I look for temples, architecture and mobility across the Indian Ocean. Closer to Dhaki's own time, and in many ways, small and big, also his collaborators. I should not forget to evoke Devangana Desai and Adam Hardy, besides Pramod Chandra and Matthew Meister, who I have already mentioned earlier. There are many, many, many more. And for one Parul speaking, there could be so many more who could bring in so many more perspectives to his work. But to return to the Maru Gurjar style and the romance and marriage of the two styles, the Maha Maru and the Maha Gurjar, about which Dhaki writes with a passion that conceals the rigor, toil, and intensity of his method and research. Let me just quote him. This cannot be said in anybody else's words. The Maha Maru style, says Dhaki, could no longer bear passively the forays of the Mahaburjar style. The reply came, laden as much with love as with vengeance. We're talking architectural styles. It launched at the close of the 10th century, a reverse three-pronged attack from Maru Shakambhari and Upper Medhbar on the forcibly defined frontiers between the two styles. Like a game, it swept over the territory of the Mahagurjar style. Defense after defense fell before its irresistible charm. Kiradu and Dhinmal in Gurjar Mandal, Chandravati in Arbuda Mandal, and Ahar in Lower Medhbad were the first to succumb. It next slipped through the gates of Patan and Hilbad, the metropolis of Gujarat. The result? It was a tense moment of intense, passionate embrace of the two leading styles of Western India, one virile and handsome, the other ornate and bewitchingly beautiful. In the process, both lost their identity, the Mahagurja to a degree greater than the Mahamar. The union resulted in a beautiful offspring, which was to be honored loved and supported by a great empire, that of the Solankis. It inherited the propensities of its parents, the basic structural forms and organizational ability of the one, and the ornateness and rich ornamental designs of the other. It is this style which I have been referring to in my recent writings as Maru Kurcha. This is Dhaki in Studies in Indian Temple Architecture, 1975. So what is all this romance and marriage and passion about? 
how how deeply involved he was when he traveled gujarat rajasthan saurashtra looking at every molding from the ground to the finial of the of the shikara and understanding how these two have come up that he must be so passionately involved to word it in uh, in this uh, fashion i think that this happy uh, uh, romance of the two styles uh, i'll take a short break from uh, my uh, talking to you and show you a few uh, uh, images uh, about how his working methods so i'll just take me as one half a minute to share the screen and uh, so let me know. Uh, can someone let me know if the screen is shared? Yeah, it's or... visible, ma'am. Uh, it's visible. Yes. I need to. Uh, I need to. Uh, yeah. Is is it occupying the full screen? Yes. Yes. So I chose this because well, let me uh, let me share a personal note here. Uh, to the left, you see uh, the mover coil kodambalur in the center you have the elevation drawing of the shore temples at mahavalipuram both courtesy american institute of indian studies gurgaon where the encyclopedia of indian temple architecture under the uh, directorship and academic uh, guidance and his own original work of Dhaki took place along with so many other authors who contributed, so many scholars who contributed to this 14 volume encyclopedia. To the right is my little uh, offering to him in the felicitation volume that, that we did, where I have resurrected the architectural, book, architectural vocabulary of some early charm Vietnamese temples from, te from temple models and uh, also considered in detail the uh, nature of uh, sources unlike in unlike in North India and South India for example coterminous to the period where we have a lot of texts in India in in Champa and Cambodia you do not have textual treatises so at that time and how do you then uh, uh, decide on the nomenclature? Do you choose the way that the current Vietnamese uh, people uh, uh, discuss them? Do you go back to the inscriptions? How do you evolve a terminology in the Southeast Asian context? But that, that's for another day. Uh, this is, of course, Dhaki sir, a very young Dhaki sir. We've already discussed, but I put his way of approaching the temple. Uh, what, were, what were his thoughts? It was it, it was not the sectarian religio ritualistic basis of the temple that interested him. Uh, it interested him, yes, to the extent of understanding how it informed the form, uh, but not not more. Mm, I've already talked about dynastic appellations and regional specificities, and how, as early as 1961. Uh, my Professor Dhaki had discussed that, well, kings do not create a style in India. Uh, these are the most interesting, and I'm very grateful to uh, Dr. Vandana Sinha and the entire team at the American Institute of Indian Studies for lending me these images. Uh, this is Dhaki Sahib and his team crossing the waters on a raft and you can see the vehicle, the van in which they traveled all over, all over the length and breadth of the country. Uh, and here they've reached, look at his excitement, the, the tiny frame, the massive shouting board. Uh, this is Nandaji, the, the photographer and Guruji, the, the uh, drafts person. How do I know them? Well, I met them many, many years later when I was pursuing my doctoral research in the American Institute of Indian Studies. This is Dhaki Saab with his usual passion, uh, explaining the Sun Temple at Modhera. And this is um, uh, 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 Professor N.K. Bose and Professor Dhaki 
there is a very interesting dialogue between them in one of the papers, a response and, and you know, where, you know, the whole idea of whether we should, uh, in, in the pan-Indic context, have a corpus of temple terminology that can be used in a pan-Indic context or whether regional specificities should be retained. And they were both on different sides of, of the debate, but, but uh, it's an exemplar in civility of scholarly disagreement. Um, here's some, uh, here are some of the encyclopedia volumes, the nature of work that went in. And uh, here you have uh, Dhaki Sap, you, and uh, guess who this is? This is uh, Moti Chandraji's son, Professor Pramod Chandra, uh, late Professor Pramod Chandra, who went on to become the uh, become a professor in Harvard. I'm not sure what this line is about. Have I created it? Okay. Um, at the bottom, again, you have Professor Dhaki, and Guess who this is? A very young Michael Meister. And here is, is, is a very engrossed discussion about the encyclopedia project. Um, this, uh, this particular photograph is from the library of the American Institute of Indian Studies, a particular favorite of mine. I, I used to live and breathe there. And that's the only way that the doctoral research could ever have come to a conclusion. Okay, this is the final glossary volume for which the world of art historians and architectural historians are waiting. And he has very stubbornly called it the Shri Dravida Devalaya Vastu Paribhasha Pragnapti. Um, I said, sir, kon parega? And he said, no, this is what it would be called. And uh, of course, it, it, there is an English version, the you know, glossary it says, but uh, he did not like the term glossary there because he wanted, um, he wanted to uh, emphasize that this is actually not a glossary. It is not a dictionary, it is not a glossary, but it is uh, a massive uh, volume that actually speaks about each of these elements, whether, you know, why is a stupi a stupi? How did the stupi come to be? Uh, what are the different terms that we get over centuries in different kinds of texts to describe it? Why should a particular term be privileged? How is the stupi, uh, uh, you know, the connotation of the term important? Why should it not be called a finial? What is the structural basis of it? What is the symbolic basis of it? Uh, and so on, or, or a griva koshta or a kapota. Um, one of the preconditions of being able to do a PhD with him uh, was to first completely sort of read up as much of his work as possible. And so, uh, so, this, so this is this actually is a special uh, privilege that that uh, one is comfortable with the massive amount of terminology uh, that that it has. Uh, so if this is Dravida Devalaya, what happens to the Nagara Devalayas? Well, it looks like while this will see the light of the day, and maybe we will all get to own a copy, uh, the Nagara Devalaya Vastu Paribhasha Pragnapti is never going come because there is no dhaki at the moment at least. Uh, Pragnapti stands for, it, it, he takes it from Jain um, sources of, you know, emphasizing its totality, emphasizing its comprehensiveness and its, its wholesomeness and uh, is opposed to the term uh, glossary. Uh, I had played with the idea of playing a few parts because I wanted you to hear it in his voice. Uh, but uh, this is easily available on YouTube. Uh, he obliged all of us really uh, by talking at length. And uh, this was sometime in 2012 or 13, I'm not sure. I was a whole lot more you know, 
as one grows, one mellows. I was a whole lot more uh, confident to talk. <laughs> and so even I'm very sort of talking without a paper in my hand and, and it's a four hour video uh, where he discusses his methods, his sources, his, his uh, motivations, uh, where I dare to provoke him about certain uh, disagreements. Uh, I think those interested may like to listen to this. Uh, I come to the last one. In, uh, with the help of my co-editor, Gerd Nevison, with the, uh, with the um, initiative of the Indian Art History Congress, and with the great support and encouragement of Dr. Devangana Desai, we managed to present him this wonderful uh, uh, volume with, with, with a great group of contributors. And as, as co-editors, Gerd Mevison and I uh, did not have to re-invite anyone. Now, this is a unique experience in bringing out a felicitation volume. Uh, so much goodwill, so much respect. Uh, and we are we're very happy that we were able to present this to him, uh, although it was, it was barely six months before he passed away. Uh, he was all his life extremely reticent to be feted with a felicitation volume. And his standard joke was, who will edit it? <laughs> anyway, so let me uh, let me stop this presentation and go back to the to the remaining uh, shorter part of uh, of the discussion. Uh, have I managed to exit? Yes, ma'am. I need to I need to put this away. Yeah. Okay. Stop sharing. Yeah. Yes. Is this fine? No. I'll be back. Um, okay. Yes, ma'am. So uh, after having shown these wonderful work slides and also after having spoken about the romance of the Maru Gurjar, uh, Maha Maru and the Ma Maru uh, Maha Gurjar styles of architecture of Rajasthan and Gujarat, let me briefly discuss Dhaki's detective art history writings, where he deploys the criteria of style again at the intersections of archeology span and history. To cite just one among these, for we do not have all night, uh, let me bring in the riddle of the temple of Somnath by Dhaki and Shastri in 1974, where he uses the criteria of style at the intersection of historical archeology span to decode the different, and Somnath is a very politically charged monument, uh, the criteria of style at the intersection of uh, history and archaeology to decode different architectural phases of building and rebuilding the Somnath Temple, a project that was entrusted to him by B.K. Thapar, and towards which he spared, Dhaki spared no mercy for the fundamentalist factions on either side of the political and ideological divide, right and left. Lending his academic weight to an evidence-based non-partisan interpretation of the Somnath temple and architectural history terms. His motivation and his inspiration to do this was not that it was a residence of God. It was not any political ideology that he was favoring. His truth were his sources and methods, and he created a document that ultimately, interestingly, became the pramana or evidence standard for reference to the layered architectural histories of the Somnath temple from an ancient 8th century small structure, which the ar archaeologists were insisting on because there were some Brahmi alphabets on it, but he discarded that as being part of the original plan of the big Somnath. So he begins with the period of Bhima Deva, 1025, and moves on up to Kumarapal, offering the different layers, uh, going to the fragments along with the Sompuras, 
to stylistically analyze the 75 year difference between the phases of the first destruction to its rebuilding by Kumarapada. Uh, in a manner that uh, uh, is best sort of uh, described as detective art history. Uh, very recently, in my paper on the Buddhist site of Fanigiri, which is just recently published, I found myself evoking this methodology in a very different context. Dhaki also pioneered a culture-specific methodology for the study of architectural elements, such as ceilings, vitanas, water spouts, pranalas, and traceries, offering micro-investigations of their types, contexts, and style. A method that inspired my own doctoral research on the Toranas, where, as a very generous supervisor, he allowed me to differ in the details of method. So while I was inspired by his method, I was also trying to do something different, and he was really uh, very generous. Uh, allowed me to take a more a historically organized discussion of the subject rather than the scientific categorization that he follows in the traceries and the uh, vitanas. Uh, this was also the time when I made my first foray into the world of South and Southeast Asian connections, again made possible by the books and photographs in the American Institute of Indian Studies Library and Archive so painstakingly collected and documented under his direction. This marked the beginnings of my own long and continued engagement with the connected histories of the Indian Ocean world. So may I say that Dhaki's way of looking at the temple, Dhaki's ways of seeing the temple became a metaphor for method in art history in my work. Since no architectural treatises have survived in large parts of Southeast Asia, I have used his methods and paths and built upon them to evolve fresh approaches in understanding the Southeast Asian temple and temple towns. Now often, and this is again very important in the, in the time that we live in, Dhaki's writings have expanded the orbit of inquiry and subject domain of temple studies itself. His enduring admiration, for example, for the great architectural systems of the past is evident in his traceries, where he devotes two complete sections to the perfectly executed whale like Islamic screens and the extraordinary flexibility and plasticity of Gothic traceries. So that volume on Indian temple traceries actually should be called Indian temple Islamic and Gothic traceries. That's the level of uh, attention that he gives to, to these parallel uh, traditions. His keen reading of texts in relation to surviving monuments is also attentive to notices on Jain architecture and iconography, the Buddhist viharas, and the Islamic mosque in medieval Indian architectural treatises. For example, in the minarets of the Hilal Khan Ghazi, for example, he says, uh, he points out rather a discussion on the architectural elements of a Rahman Prasada, the temple of Rahman or a mosque. In another text, it is called the Rahman, Rahman Surale. This Rahman Prasada is mentioned in the 12th century Jayapracha, a Western Indian Vastu text. The same paper provides an engaging discussion of the ways by which Maru Gurjar elements were reconfigured to evoke the character of an Islamic monument. Deeply sensitive to the interrelationships between aesthetics and formal uh, visions of the visual and performing arts, Dhaki perceives parallels between oral forms of Hindustani and Carnatic music systems and the forms of Northern and Southern Indian temple superstructures. Music was a passion with him. And in the architectonics of the Shastra, 
Shastriya Sangeet of India, uh, he actually uh, sees the visualization of oral forms in architecture. We had some wonderful discussions on this, and I should share these per this personal note uh, where I, I spoke to him about this kind of interconnectedness of architecture, sculpture, dance, and music, and why it is not so mainstream in uh, art historical uh, writing. And, and his answer was uh, very, very uh, profound and also uh, simple because he just said that for somebody to write, uh, it depends on the level of perception of these alternate, of these different mediums of expression. So the parallels, the correspondence, Abundances exist, but who will write? Somebody who is equally conversant in the two. Uh, speaking of sculpture, in, in his uh, pr profound paper on the Jinnah image and Agamic and Hymnic tradition, he engages with philosophical deliberations on the inherent self-contradiction of the Jinnah in, in making the Jinnah image for worship. So uh, given the philosophy, Nirgrant philosophy, should a Jinnah image be in worship? And he offers this as a counterpoint to the persistent presence of Jinnah imagery in the archaeological records. Quite similar to the Buddha image. This is, this is a, a different work on the uh, Jinnah image, where he reads across a range of Salmic and Hymnic texts in Maharashtri and Ardhru Magadhi Prakrit to pick out the theological clarifications and compromises. How did the, uh, you know, how did religion, how did theological uh, dictum compromise with the worship of the Jinnah image? Say, sample this in his words, the embodied arhat or Jinnah does not possess motivating power. He can neither, so, so why are you worshiping him? He can neither bestow favor prasada, nor inflict harm for activity in any form is for the self, the cause as well as evidence of the state of bondage. So if the jinnah can bestow a favor, he is still in a state of bondage and not release. In Chol sculpture, Dhaki's perceptive eye sees Chol art as being reflective of contradicting tendencies to realize and to idealize, to elaborate as well as to schematize, to stabilize, but also to vaporize. Questioning the extent of Pallava style on Chol sculpture, Dhaki draws subtle distinctions between sculptural idioms, the Chol, Irukaval veil, and Paduvetteriyar that prevailed concurrently in the region. Rather than depending on overarching theories or preconceived notions, he asserts the importance of rooting one's methods in the evidence as it presents himself. This is again like style, a recurring, recurring motif in his writings. Throughout his scrutiny of the different phases of Chol sculptures, their architectural context is never lost sight of. Sculpture is perceived and dis discussed for the distinctiveness of physiognomy and expression, plastic qualities, sense of movement and stillness, and the impact of its specific location on the monument. But now let's come to the marginal characters that inhabit and animate the temple walls. These have also not been spared of Dhaki's attention. The Bhutas or Shiva's troop of elementals, as he explains in a paper devoted to them, personify the elemental fragments of creation and cover the entire range of nature in their inherent as well as coherent forces. Similarly, is his volume on the Vyalas or the hybrid Leonine creatures. Now, in the little time at hand, I 
I have tried to offer a representative sample of the rich Ugru of this rare scholar, revealing his remarkable breadth of vision, profound depth of inquiry, and pioneering methods. There is, of course, more, much more that could be discussed. And undoubtedly, it could be perceived very differently from some other speaker scholar in my place. Yet, on one point, I think many of us will agree. No discerning mind among the many who would have read and reread his works can fail to see the fundamental ways in which M. A. Dhaki has shaped, defined, and redefined the discipline of Indian art history. In honor of his scholarship and his dispassionate search for incontrovertible evidence in art history writing, which is of universal value, and in honor and fond memory of his mentorship that is of immense personal value to me, I conclude this lecture with his all time favorite excerpt from the Nyaya Vatara of Siddha Sen or Siddharshi. Ramanam Svaparabhasi Nanam Badha Vivarjita. That knowledge is dependable, which illuminates the self and the other and is incontrovertible. On the occasion of his 94th birth anniversary, in the spirit of this rare scholar and human, I thank all of you for your patience in listening to me. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. It was a very intriguing lecture. Good evening all. I'm Shantini and I'm here to present a vote of thanks for today's lecture. 